Unfortunately, uh, I don't speak Estonian yet, so I'll have to do my presentation in English, but hello and good morning. Um, I have here on the screen uh, an IRC channel. Uh, I still use IRC every day, even though it's about 20 years old. Uh, there are things like Twitter that are fancier, but I like IRC still. I want to talk today about uh, open source communities that are geographically distributed and how they work together, because I come from a very small town in a part of the world that's not too dissimilar from Estonia in terms of uh, being dark and cold a lot of the year. So I feel, I feel kind of at home here. Um, so I work on a project uh, that's called Node.js. Uh, Node was uh, started in about 2008 by a guy named Ryan. And he was a mathematician uh, who studied in school. He was, he was working on his math uh, PhD. And he was living in various parts of the world and kind of realized um, that web servers uh, were too hard to write. They were, they were these giant, big, monolithic systems. And they were uh, um, difficult and complicated. And he wanted to make something simpler. So he worked on this new software. And it was written in JavaScript, which is insane at the time. Uh, at the time, most people thought, Java, like he meant Java when he said it was written in JavaScript. Um, but there, as any programmer would know, Java and JavaScript are completely separate beasts. Um, so now Node has grown into the fastest growing open source project in terms of um, contributors in the world, um, There's in terms of server-side software. So it has um, a ton of activity all around the world. And, and Ryan has since left the project and moved on to other things. But there are thousands of people that have taken his place. Um, but we'll, we'll look at kind of some different aspects of how a huge open source project work, works and what Node does to make it successful so that it can have people contributing to it from all around the world. And this is one part. So here is uh, an international channel. There's a few hundred people in here who are talking about Node all the time. And um, I said I logged in as a user called Estonia. And I said, hello from Estonia. Someone said, hello. And then somebody said, I feel like I'm addressing the entire country, which is pretty funny. And then somebody asked a technical question. So this is just kind of uh, anybody can log in here and, and ask questions and receive answers um, at any time in the day. And IRC is an important part of an open source community, but it extends a lot further than IRC. IRC has been around for a long time, and open source communities have been using it. But um, one of the more recent innovations is um, GitHub. So could I uh, do a quick show of hands? How many of you are programmers here in the room? OK, nice. And uh, how many of you have a GitHub account? OK, good, 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 good. Uh, that means that you can get hired by companies all around the world if you want to. Um, this is the Node project uh, for the last year, uh, three years. And it breaks it down by contributors. So Ryan, the original project author, started. And he, he has the bulk of the work up here on the, the left. And then uh, Isaac took it over. And so Isaac's been doing most of the work later. Um, what's interesting about this is that Node itself um, doesn't have that many people that work on it. It's a huge open source project. Let's look at the stats up at the top. It has uh, 18,000 people who have subscribed to the repository, 2,500 people around the world who have actually contributed to the repository. So you know, thousands of people are working on this. There are currently about 500 different um, outstanding issues that people have reported. And there are 85 current patches that are waiting to get pulled in, uh, features that have been implemented and are waiting to get merged into the Node project. So it's highly collaborative. However, um, what's interesting about Node itself as you can see, the top four contributors here um, have done the majority of the work. So Ryan and Isaac are both from America. They lived in the Bay Area for a while. Um, and Isaac still does. And they work at a company called Joyent. And Joyent uh, is kind of the chief steward. So there's this company that is technically in charge of the Node project, but they have two employees that work on it. Then the next two employees down, B. Nordhaus and Pisosaurus, um, they live in Amsterdam. I was actually just in Amsterdam last week and got to meet them. Uh, on, on a canal boat in Amsterdam. And they work at a different company. 
So the top two are one company. The bottom two are the next company. Uh, they're called Cloud9. They make um, a code editor that you can write code in your browser, and it syncs it up to the cloud. It's an interesting product. Um, so you have four different people from two different companies doing the majority of the work. And then uh, just in terms of graph, like if the amount of orange is how much work they've done. And then the next two, um, I don't actually, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know who Koichik is. I have not met him or her. But uh, Fedor lives in Moscow uh, and not too far away. Same time zone, I think. And he works at yet another company. And Nate uh, lives in the Bay Area and works at another company. Felix lives in uh, Germany and works at another company. So uh, if you look at the top eight contributors, you get five different companies. So you have one project that solves a common set of things and about eight people do the majority of the work. Um, as you go down in contributors, the orange gets less and less and less and further along in the long tail of contributor, contributorness. So what's interesting to me is that there's these few, these few people from these few core companies who are highly invested in this project, and thousands of other people can use it. Uh, but it only takes a few people to make the project successful. So where did the thousands of people come from? Um, the interesting... I'll, I'll get to, I'll get to uh, what makes Node popular, but the core is really, really small. There's only two or three people that really do the high engineering work, and then a couple people that do the kind of documentation and releases and evangelism. Um, so the project itself is really small, and that's really important. For a good open source project um, that is seeking a wide audience, the smaller it is, the better. Because the more complicated it is, the harder it is to learn. So, the thing about this also is that you don't see their company names here. You see their individual names. So uh, Isaac and Ryan, if they move on from their company, or if Ben or Bert, they move on from their company, all of their credit is attached to their individual name. So they're not uh, contributing to this project from under their company name, and their company isn't taking credit. It's really important that their actual individual um, kind of reputation is getting established. And GitHub has kind of replaced the resume in a lot of programming circles. So myself personally, um, I don't need a resume anymore uh, because I can just point employers at my GitHub projects. And they can go there and they can see, oh, OK, uh, well, let's go to github.com, Max Ogden. If I was somebody who was trying to hire myself, I would go here and I would say, oh, OK, he has um, hundreds of things that he works on, and there's all these projects. And they can actually go in and look at my code. And they can evaluate how good of a programmer I am based on how collaborative I am and how much code I write and what the quality of the code is and if other people use my code. Like this one um, has some people that watch. I have, I have people that have subscribed to my libraries, which means that I must write something that some people use, even if it's not thousands of people. So um, having a GitHub project is probably, I would say, the number one most important tool for promoting uh, your, yourself as a programmer looking to work with other people for commercial purposes or just for collaborative purposes. If you put everything on GitHub, then people can find you, they can find your code, they can take your project. If they're trying to solve a problem that you've already solved, they're more likely to just use your solution rather than building their own solution. So um, it, it's this interesting uh, phenomenon that GitHub is now a resume. And GitHub basically, to me, I summarize it by saying that it is just a platform for collaboration. It's a place to integrate your workflow with somebody else's workflow and not solve common problems. Open source is really good at, at taking uh, a full set of problems, finding the ones that need to be open sourced and collaborated, and then uh, like GitHub gives you tools to actually collaborate and execute on open source collaboration. So um, the interesting thing also about these people here that work on Node is that for the large part, they're geographically distributed. They're all around the world, and they work at different companies, but they still work on the same code because their companies let them um, work directly on the open source. So Node itself um, is a JavaScript and C++ layer to do systems programming. Input, output streams, reading from disk, reading to the network, um, talking to databases. It's kind of this glue layer for I.O. And uh, there's a, a JavaScript layer that talks to a C++ layer, and the C++ layer is called libuv. And libuv um, is used in more than just Node for JavaScript. It's, it's used in a lot of different um, projects now. There's bindings in Ruby. There's bindings in Lua. Um, you can use libuv outside of 
uh, node, so you don't have to write JavaScript to use it, but that makes it even more interesting because it in itself has an even wider audience than just people writing JavaScript on the server. So um, the libuv team is even smaller. There's only a few people that um, work directly on it. Uh, so the theme of Node is the smallest possible component is better. The smallest thing that you can reduce your project down to, um, you should do that. It's kind of the Unix philosophy of small modules loosely joined. Don't build huge systems that are hard to, to reason about. Break things down into small problems and, and separate them. So Node itself was separated into just the C++ layer, and then Node is a little bit of C++ and mostly JavaScript on top. And then uh, there's the more important aspect of this, though, is the package manager. Um, but I'll get to that in a moment. So Node itself, the entire library, this is uh, maybe the most popular server-side programming language in the last few years. Um, you can fit it all on one page. The in this is every API call possible um, is in this one relatively tall page, but it fits all in one website. Um, and all the docs are available on one page, and you could go through everything and, um, and see the full index. So there's uh, about 20 core modules. They do things like um, read the file system, do cryptography, read to uh, like encrypt connections into SSL, um, common things. So there's 20 or 30 core modules in Node, and that's it. Anything that they could have put uh, into a third-party module they left out. So Node is as small as possible in the core. And what this means is because it's a nice small core, it's really fun to build on top of because there's thousands of things that Node doesn't do. To contrast this, you might think of um, like the Python standard library. Um, it has a ton of stuff in the standard library, which is convenient, but it ma makes it harder to change. If it's something that's shipped with a Python distribution, it means it's going to be in there for longer, and if you want to change it, you have to get your patch into the core uh, set of features, whereas if it's a third-party module, it can be um, updated independently of the core. So um, Node is a small core, but this is the Node package manager. And originally, it started outside of Node. Um, Isaac, actually, who's in charge of the Node project now, he started this project because there wasn't a way to share module code um, between developers. So Node package manager is now, it's actually about to hit 15,000 packages. Um, which is pretty awesome. A year ago, um, NPM was at about 3,000. And a year before that, it was about 100. <laughs> so it's growing really quickly. Uh, it's great. And uh, there's, let's see, about half a million downloads of modules a day. And uh, I think that's 3.2 million downloads this last week. So a lot of people are using NPM. Um, there's a chart that I, I didn't bring up here, but it shows all package managers from Perl, Ruby, Python, Java, uh, and it shows kind of the growth rate of the package managers over time, how many new packages are published, and NPMs is the fastest. So what that tells me is either the package manager is um, the easiest to deploy or people really like writing JavaScript on the server, and it's a combination of the both. So when you look on NPM, you see things that aren't in Node Core at all. The most popular library this is kind of like a, there's the most popular one, 1,300 modules depend on, um, is just kind of helper, helper functions to do common tasks in JavaScript. This one is an HTTP client library. Um, CoffeeScript is an alternate syntax for JavaScript. This helps you write um, evented I.O. functions. This is a web server. This is a command line argument parser, um, a thing that makes your code different colors. So there's all sorts of um, different third-party modules that are very popular um, that aren't in Node Core and are, in, and are maintained by individuals. So for instance, Request, the most popular HTTP client library, um, is maintained by uh, a man named Michael. And Michael and I actually, we run a small software company together in Oakland, California, um, where uh, a lot of the Node Core team lives. And so Michael wrote this module because he has a lot of experience with HTTP. And when Node came out, you had to write a program about this long to make an HTTP request. And he made it so your program is this long. So naturally, his module is very popular. It gets about 10,000 downloads a day. Um, the interesting thing about NPM is it lets you see the GitHub repository directly. So if somebody finds a bug when they're using requests, they can 
exactly like get linked exactly to the GitHub page and go and open up issues and um, see what the bug that they've experienced might be. So there's a tight integration between uh, NPM and the like the GitHub pages for each NPM module. And so let's see. So there's uh, not that, the, the, I think the thing that NPM got right versus all other package managers is that it's simple, just like Node Core. Um, it's really easy to make a new module. And so um, one module that I wanted to show, here's a module that I wrote recently, just to give you an example of what it's like to contribute a new module to NPM. So kind of how a module is um, set up is there's four files. This is the minimum, I think, that you can do. So you have the actual source code of the module, and I'll show that in a minute. And then you have this thing called the package.json, and it's just a file that has metadata about the project, who the maintainer is, what version it is, where the GitHub project is. Then you have a readme, which is important. A readme will show up on NPM, the NPM website, when people search for the module in the command line and when they find it on GitHub has instructions for how to use the module and what it does. And then you have a test uh, so that when people download your code, they can run the test suite to make sure that everything works on their computer. And more importantly, when they uh, take your code and extend it and add new features, they can run your test suite to make sure they didn't break anything. Um, when people submit patches to me and the they break the tests, I tell them to go back and fix the tests. So the actual source code of this module um, is pretty straightforward. It's um, only 52 lines of code. So it has, um, I won't go into the details of what this does, but it solves one very specific problem. Um, and it's only 50 lines, 1.3 kilobytes. And then the package JSON, the actual description of the project, is 13 lines. And it has a description, it has some keywords for people who are searching, it has the version number, which I increment every time I add a new feature, uh, and then it points to the GitHub repository and my name, and then it tells you where to go to submit bugs, if you find a bug and you want to tell me about it. So all you have to do to make a project is make a folder, put two files in it, the source code and this JSON file, and all the JSON file really needs is the name and version, everything else is optional. And then in your command line, you can say npm publish, and it'll put it up on npm, and other people can use it. So it's great. It, makes, it lowers the barrier so low for new contributors. That's why there's 15,000 packages. That's why a ton of people are using each other's code on npm. And it's really easy to install as well. So I call this um, concat stream. And so the first part of the readme shows you how to install it locally. So anybody can go to their command line who has node installed and say npm install concat stream and they'll download the module that I wrote as, as well as any uh, external dependencies that this module depends on. And that's another thing that npm got um, right is it makes it easier for you to build on top of other people's modules. So you might have this complex tree of you write a module that depends on this guy's module who he writes a mod, that module depends on this guy's module, and then that guy's module depends on her module, and her module depends on her module, and so you have this huge tree, but when you type npm install, the name up here, it goes and fetches everything all at once and gets them all into your, your computer. And it makes it really easy to, to tie together different solutions from different people. The key part of that is the same Unix philosophy of don't, like, don't write all the solutions in one module, only write one solution at a time and go and check NPM and see if somebody else has written the other components and just use those instead. So there's, um, people will kind of get angry when you make too large of modules. Um, if you try to solve too many problems at once, they'll say, why don't you break this up into two smaller modules and have them live independent lives. Um, the motivation why you write modules um, comes from a, a few different places. This is a, 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 a new acronym that came out in the community called JIFASNIF, um, which is up here at the top. It's uh, J-I-F-A-S-N-I-F, JIFASNIF. In the Ruby community, there's this one called Miniswan, and it means 
Uh, Maps is nice, and so we are nice. And it's kind of a mantra that Ruby programmers use. Maps is the name of the guy who started the Ruby language. And people, when two people get angry at each other online, uh, you, they would say, Miniswan, remember, the man who created this language is a nice person. So why are you being mean to each other? You should be nice as well. So the equivalent in JavaScript is that because JavaScript is fun, it's simple, it's lightweight, Node is fun. And this is an illustration of my friend James writing a mechanical bull and coding. So JavaScript is fun and Node is fun. It's fun to contribute. You get to write these little pieces that other people use. There's nothing more gratifying for me than knowing that somebody has taken my code and done something interesting with it. Um, so JavaScript is a fun language. People like photos of cats. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on, and a lot of people that are, they're not, um, they're not afraid to reinvent the wheel and look at different, faster ways of doing something. So here's an example of one of my projects that uh, this guy, Dominic, who lives in New Zealand, found a problem with. He, he asked me, would it be possible to do this certain feature? And then he actually coded it. So I could look at his code. Here he's um, changed the word emit to the word write. He found a bug in my code. And then I told him, oh, actually, when you change it, it breaks this other thing. So he went back, and he added more changes. So then he added some more code to make it make more sense. And then I finally said, OK, I'll take, I'll take it now. So this is kind of an example back and forth, where he asks a question, changes some code. I tell him his code didn't change the right parts. So he goes back, fixes it 100%. And then finally, I merge it in and close the issue. So if we look at the history of this project, in the commits, I believe. So here, I had, um, it's my commit, my commit, my commit, and then I added Dominic's um, in these. And so he's now a contributor to this project. So you'll notice that the actual commit that he added was only a few lines of code. So people are sending these li little tiny diffs around um, because a lot of the projects are small. The smaller, the better. So there's a lot of people in the community um, who write a lot of modules. So that guy on the bowl who is coding, his name is James, and he lives in Oakland. I used to be his roommate, and we lived together. And um, he has the record for the most modules of any one person. So he's written more modules than anybody else. I think if I go to um, npmjs.org, I can find out how many. A large number now. Aha, substack. Oh, it doesn't say how many. Well, he has a lot. I don't know the exact number. I think it's around 150. So what he does is, as he's working, he has um, this company that does cross-browser testing so you can test your, what your website looks like in Internet Explorer 6 or um, old versions of Firefox or old versions of Chrome. And he lets you go in your browser, put in your website, and it shows you a little browser to simulate. or It shows, it what, shows you what it looks like in Internet Explorer. And so as he's building this, there's all these different pieces that he has to build. And he's really good at finding the little pieces and turning them into modules. So he has all of these modules, and a ton of people use his code and for all sorts of things that are unrelated to his company. Um, and he's, he's kind of like the, he's the, the person with the most modules. The person with the second most modules is this guy, TJ, who lives up in Canada in North America. And he also has a ton of modules. He came from the Ruby community and knows how to make modules that have um, nice interfaces and are easy to use. So TJ and Substack both um, contribute a lot of code. And as a side effect, a lot of people watch what they do online. Um, also, uh, TJ works with um, 
this guy, Guillermo. Oop. Uh, maybe it's this one. Yeah, here we are. So Guillermo is from Argentina and founded a company uh, that does software for classrooms for teachers to collaborate with students. And he just wrote his first book. So his book is actually up on GitHub now. It's a book about Node. And he also organizes a conference in Argentina called JavaScripts Argentina. So Guillermo um, is working on moving to the United States because his company now employs a lot of people, including TJ um, and some of the contributors to Node. And what Guillermo did was make a, a software package for um, real-time collaboration in the browser. So let me go here. This is a programming competition that happens in Node. The next one is coming up on November 10th. And you can sign up for Teams. It's a kind of a weekend event where you try to build the coolest thing you can using server-side JavaScript. And I really like the website because when you log in, you get a little guy. And you can click, and your guy will move there. And you can, you can even say, like, hello. And anybody else that logs in, they, they get a little guy, too. So for instance, if anybody in the audience goes to nodeknockout.com, they'll have a little character that shows up. I can make a couple. <laughs> All right, uh, there we are. Oops. So this is an example of a program that uses server-side JavaScript that can handle many concurrent users. <laughs> and this would scale up to thousands of people running around on the screen. Um, so Node Knockout is a fun event. It's meant to uh, give you an opportunity to build something for fun, kind of Jiffy sniff style. So if anybody wants to do Node Knockout, I totally recommend signing up for a team doing some Node intro classes in the meantime, and contributing some code. <laughs> now we have a little party going on here. Um, some of the um, other aspects of the Node community that are really awesome is the, the people and the conferences. You meet a lot of people from all around the world when you work on Node. And uh, this is an example of summer camp that happens. This was last week, or two weeks ago in California. So we had uh, 100, 100 or so people fly in from all around the world, and we took over a, a camp, a summer camp up in the woods. And uh, we all went outside and used boats, um, played kickball. Um, these are people who are usually in front of their computers in like Russia, right? But they come to California, and they play kickball with each other. It's really funny. Uh, there's a lot of really good pictures of it online um, from all the different events that we had and uh, playing kickball with each other. So there's a really important part of open source communities is getting to meet people face to face. And sometimes it's really difficult when you're all around the world. But because Node got really popular, now there's Node conferences popping up all over the place. Um, there was this one this week in Shanghai. Um, it was HUJS. And Substack from Oakland actually um, went all the way to Shanghai and spoke here, um, which is great. So there's, there's the community is kind of pollinating all around the world. Um, next week, I'm going to Lisbon, uh, Portugal, for the first time and speaking at the Lisbon JavaScript conference, um, which is organized by uh, another, another Node community member. And then there's um, JavaScript Argentina which happened, and that was Guillermo's conference. And I got to go down there for that. And it was the furthest south I've ever been. And here is the furthest north I've ever been. So I haven't ever, I never really traveled before uh, I got involved with Node. And it gave me opportunities to go around and speak about it. Um, so that was the, the core um, aspects I wanted to share about the open source collaboration part. Uh, but I'm wondering if anybody has questions. Mm. You can ask also the student, I can translate. Uh, oh, yeah. 
if yeah, if you if you want to ask in Estonian, we can translate. Oh yeah. Stage, yeah, so I got I first got involved with the node project because I worked at a nonprofit. Um, this was started only two years ago, and what it does is it um, partners with cities. Not the nation, not the national government, not like Obama, but cities, mayors, small places, like uh, a couple million people. And works with them to use modern open source technology to make the cities run better. So uh, one thing I made, this was a, a tool we made for parents to find schools that are appropriate for their children to go to. So if you want to see all the schools in a city and you wanted to compare them on different metrics, we put this together. Um, a website that parents could go to and kind of browse the schools that they're eligible to go to. You have to live close to a school in order to be eligible. Um, and previously, parents had to read a huge PDF file that was about that big um, or go to the school and pick up a pamphlet. So we put all that stuff online. Um, school bus. And then here's another one we made, which was an app that parents could see on their smartphone where their uh, school bus was, where their kid was between school and home. So if it's dinner time and your child isn't home yet, you could log onto your phone and see exactly the GPS location of the bus and know when it'll arrive. Um, this saved a lot of money for the school district because they uh, don't have to employ as many people to answer phone calls from parents anymore. So we kind of tried to modernize their infrastructure and show them what's possible um, using open source code. And then let's see if this one is still going. Uh, it might not be. What's the fellows program? What's the oh, yeah. format of it? No? Oh, yeah. And another really important the Code for Europe fellows application is opening up soon. So the way that, the, that this program works is you move to a new city for a year and they pay you a uh, living wage. Um, not as much as if you work at a software company, but enough to live on. And you get to do open source projects as much as you want and work specifically with a city to solve their problems. So I was living in one city in the United States, and I moved to San Francisco and started working with the school system. So um, I had never worked for a school system before. And previously, I'd worked at market research companies, bigger software companies, and I didn't have as much time during the day to write open source code. So for me, I had about maybe 20 projects before I started, um, 20 different GitHub repositories. And then after the year of doing the fellowship program, I had 120. So in one year, I did so much open source. Every day, I got to work on different projects to try to make city government work better. And at the end of it, um, I had met Michael, who wrote the HTTP library, and we started a company together. So I went from working at a company to working on open source for a year and then starting a company at the end of it. It was a really great experience for me. Um, Code for America started only two years ago. And this yesterday, <laughs> up in Helsinki, uh, they just launched Code for Europe. And it's a very similar program. And the application is actually opening up at the first of the month. Um, it's a six-month. Uh, Code for America is one year, and Code for Europe is going to be six months, but the same kind of idea. And one of the cities is Helsinki, so you would work for Helsinki, do the same kind of things, um, try to build maybe smartphone apps or different web apps that um, solve different problems. So it's a really exciting kind of new trend in trying to make the uh, civic government work better and introduce modern technology from startups and big open source projects into local government, which is somewhere that there's not a lot of exciting technology usually. Yeah, and that's also the reason why, yeah, or why you probably were at Upfest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got to come to Europe to, um, to work. Uh, well, I spoke at one conference in Amsterdam, and then I came to Helsinki because of the Open Knowledge Fest, which was an incredible event. Um, the uh, conference in 
Amsterdam was for a different large open source project um, that I'm involved with other than Node, and that's called PhoneGap, which is by Adobe, the people that make Flash. <laughs> and PhoneGap is a mobile phone programming framework. Um, so it lets you write JavaScript code that runs on phones. So I have, a, like for instance, the iPhone. I have an app that I work on that runs on there and is written in JavaScript as well. So when this app opens up, it talks to Node running in the cloud. And, but on here, it's a JavaScript application that um, runs on iPhone. And then I have some Androids in my backpack. And it runs on Androids as well. So when you learn JavaScript, you can pretty much work anywhere. You could work in desktop web browsers. You can work on phones. You could work on servers. Um, I used to use other programming languages, but then I realized that JavaScript is everywhere. Um, and it's a really kind of ubiquitous programming language now. Does any, so does anybody, have you ever taken a JavaScript class at this school? Do they teach JavaScript anywhere? A little bit? They should teach more. It's the, old, the old way of teaching JavaScript is really bad. Up until about 2008, it was nobody understood it. So in the last four years, it's been rediscovered. And JavaScript is now a first class citizen uh, amongst dynamic programming languages. It's still important to learn C. Definitely learn C. But if you're going to learn a dynamic language, try out JavaScript. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh, it's OK Festival. Yeah. Yeah, this is definitely something to check out. Um, it was about 800 people from around the world up in Helsinki all this week. And the last day was today. And they were talking about different aspects of um, coding for cities or coding for governments. Um, and there's all sorts of different topics that they had. Things from, um, let me see, I think. I do have, let's see here. Yeah, they, uh, they had a, a laser cutter. And so the software I work on is this. It's called Gather. And here's the logo. And so I had the logo laser cut out, which was kind of fun. And I got to make the vector art and then see the laser cut it out. And I'd never done that before. And that was pretty enter entertaining. So there was all sorts of people doing different aspects of uh, open culture, be it open laser cutters or open source or open cities. And it was super interesting. So I would say that I got involved with kind of open cities a few years ago, and then more open source. And those two communities are kind of exploding around the world right now. And everybody's sharing their background and um, the kind of things that they've done in their cities or in their programming communities that work. And so there's opportunities to travel all around the world and meet people. And it's kind of an amazing phenomenon. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, what would you say are the biggest problems in the Node.js right now? Ah, so in Node, yeah. the biggest problems in Node are that it's too popular. <laughs> um, there's so many modules that if you try to go and find one, you end up finding 30 or 40 that all do the same kind of aspect of the thing you're looking for. So um, it's a victim of its own success in a way. So um, they're working on that. They're making it so that you can see packages that, are, um, that have more watchers on GitHub or have more contributors or have, you know, like, that have been around longer and giving you different ways to see which packages you should actually use. But um, right now, it's just kind of overwhelming because so many people are using it. It's hard to keep up. Um, but that's sort of a problem, but that's sort of, it's also a good thing. Um, but the, also, the thing with Node is, the actual features of Node itself are kind of done. So you know, it is not really going to move that much faster. 
So the node core has kind of stabilized, and it's not going anywhere for a while. And now all of the energy is getting put into these third-party modules. But it's still only about uh, a year into the massive growth. And so I think it still has a long way to go, and there's a lot of unsolved problems. Um, one module I was going to show off, I wrote last week. It um, takes this thing in Chrome. So if I go to Google, there's this special feature of Google Chrome that if you hover over an input form and your computer has a microphone, this one shows a keyboard, but sometimes it shows a little microphone. And if you click the microphone, you can speak. And then it figures out what you said, and it puts the text in, kind of like Siri on the iPhone. And um, I found out how they were actually doing that. And it's the secret Google address. So it's, oops, Ooh, hold on, uh, hyphen. <laughs> So I wrote this module, oh, it's actually here. I wrote a small node program um, that uses this hidden Google feature so that you could, you could give it a large audio file and it'll transcribe it for you. So it does speech to text using Google's secret voice transcoding service, um, which is kind of interesting. So you can, um, you can pipe in some text and it'll try to convert it to a robot voice, and then transcribe the robot voice. Or you could just pipe in a WAV file, and it will try to uh, transcode the WAV file. But it's really entertaining because it, it's sort of accurate, but not really. So sometimes it gets funny translations. Um, but this is an example of a kind of fun program in Node. Like The Google API only lets you do 20 seconds at a time. But I pipe in a huge WAV file and split it up into 20 second chunks and process them each one at a time and then replay the output out to your terminal. So um, one of the other really amazing conferences coming up is this, which is nodecopter.js. And this is in Berlin in about a week or two. And the, so you take these helicopters, and for one day, you get on a team of three people. Each team gets one of these helicopters. It's about that big. And you use Node to program the helicopter. So it's a competition to see who can do the craziest thing with the helicopter in one day. And you're all in this big gymnasium together. And um, this is the best I'll part. Be at the same time. Yeah, I think that there might be a battle, a robot battle. Um, why? Flying robots in Node.js. Why not? Um, so all they do is they put you in this room with a helicopter give you a laptop and give you a helicopter and let you go crazy. And so the idea that we have, the best part is that they get all these big software companies to sponsor it so it's free. And uh, so the idea I have is to put this phone, this is a little heavy, but I have a lighter weight one, this phone on the helicopter so it'll kind of be like floating and I can have the camera be sending back the feed to another phone that I control the helicopter with and I can see what the, the helicopter sees. And um, we can kind of have like a remote control spy helicopter. So I'm going to be trying to build that. And we'll see how it goes. But uh, this is another great event organized by one of the Node, the Node people. Node is a, a very fun, fun language. Cool. Well, unless there are no more questions, that will be everything. <laughs> On speed? Yeah. So JavaScript has gotten a lot faster. Um, I think there's, if this is still up, this is a graph that Mozilla does of JavaScript speed over time. And now they're all kind of, they're not getting any faster. JavaScript is pretty fast. As you can see, they have, they've been the same speed for a long time. These are the different JavaScript engines. And you have Chrome and Safari and Firefox. For a while. Time, it's actually two days, I think, the timeline. Oh, well, yeah. they, had it, they had it at two days because for a long time, Chrome was so fast. And 
Firefox was a lot slower, and every day Firefox would be getting faster. Okay. So um, I don't have the historic view, but uh, this is a competition, basically, because Google, when Chrome came out, it kind of changed everything. Node is actually built on top of the JavaScript engine inside of Chrome. So before Chrome, there wasn't a really fast JavaScript engine in any browser. But then Chrome came out, and then it upped the game for everybody else. So then everybody, everybody else started, the yeah, they started catching up to Chrome, and now everybody's basically caught up. So um, JavaScript speed is you know, hundreds of times faster than it was five years ago. Um, it's still not as fast as writing a program in C, but it's a lot easier and more fun <laughs> than writing a program in PRC all the time. Oh, yeah. They're catching up. Um, I think certain like things. Two times, three times, uh, one point five. Yeah, something around there. Probably like within one or two multiples. I think that for Flash, it's a lot harder to write. Um, and it's um, kind of. Adobe actually is moving away from it. So they're, they don't make any money on Flash anymore, and they're working on HTML5. And so Flash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Flash doesn't run on the most popular selling smartphone. So it's, uh, it's, oops, it's kind of um, on its way out because it's very inelegant. It's still useful for certain things. Like certain animations are easier to do in Flash, but there are open source or like HTML5 versions of animations and really rich 3D stuff you can do in browser. But there, for like really rich animation, it's kind of still competitive. But for most things that you'd use Flash for, like visualizations, I think. The speed issue is um, not there anymore. And also, when we are talking about Node.js, uh, uh, because of the async nature and uh, underlying the lib, lib UV, the IEO is impossibly fast. Yeah. So it's, it's like magic. <laughs> it is magic. <laughs> yeah, there is, I think, one statistic is that to read from memory is 100,000 times, 100, times faster than to read from disk roughly speaking. So that's a lot of difference between pure memory apps and pure disk apps. And so Node really exists to make uh, reading from disk, many disks and many network connections fast. So um, yeah, it's, I think it's sufficiently fast. It's not the fastest, but it's fast enough for a lot of purposes. Well, if you consider the programming time, to, to make a scalable application in C, <laughs> this, uh, comparable speed with Node. Yeah. Is, uh, effort is not comparable. Yeah, that's a good, a really good point. I have to write five lines of code and everything works and everything is scalable and fast. Because you can't make blocking I.O. Yeah. Basically, you are forced to use async everywhere. Mm. It, it will be fast to make something like that in C. Hard work. Really hard. For the webcast, I'll repeat. Uh, basically, like, the opportunity cost is the real value. It's a lot easier to write in Node, and it's still really fast compared to everything else. And it's very tedious to write it in C. <laughs> Definitely. But C is still good to know. Definitely learn C. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. <laughs>